stirring the coffee with chopsticks using the vortex method, the only true way to optimize the taste of your coffee at the molecular level. Good morning. Welcome to the Daybreak Show, albeit a little bit later than usual. I am the Sultan. We'll get started, but first, Black Rifle Coffee, a gift from John Hoover. Nice. Perfect. Haven't had a bad cup yet. Although I was on a streak, right, for about two weeks there. I try everything. Everything. Some people say, why did you shave the big beard? Because I try everything. I've had every facial hairstyle. In my life, I like different bikes, different cars, trucks, places where I live, different kinds of food. I'll never forget the time that my kids were at the house, and one night there was chopsticks at the table. The kids said, Dad, where's the forks? Fork, spoon, and knife. I said, tonight we're using chopsticks. And they, they looked at each other, and they're like, oh, Dad's doing it again. So literally dinner that night took over two hours. Normally, you know, with kids, you're done with dinner in 20 minutes, if that, because they're just eating, and then they want to go and do their thing. I will never forget, that was a two-hour dinner. And we actually had fun. It was frustrating at first, but we were laughing. Teaching the kids how to use chopsticks to eat. I use chopsticks now because I eat slower. I am a shoveler and I eat fast. I remember as a kid, my parents saying to me, slow down. What are you in a hurry? You go, what is it? You going to a fire or something like that? Because I would just eat. I don't know why, but I just eat fast. Chopsticks have helped me slow down because it just takes a little bit of time. You can't eat fast when you eat with chopsticks. You can't do it. And that just became a thing with me. So the kids were like, oh, God, Dad, we're, what is it now? And like my oldest son once said to me, uh, he actually told me a couple weeks ago, he says, Dad, the memories I have with you of eating strange, bizarre foods, eating with chopsticks, he said, I, I will never, ever forget that as long as I live. Because we always tried things. And I encourage people to try things all the time. Try it. Just try it. You don't like this workout? You don't think this is going to, you don't think this is for you? Just try it. Just try it. If I served a different food and my kids didn't think they would like it, my answer, my response to them would be, how do you know you don't like it if you haven't tried it? Taste it and then decide. It's like everything in life. Have you tried it? If you don't like it, maybe try it again. Maybe it's something that takes a little getting used to or adapting to. And nine times out of ten, you can make an informed decision if you try it first. If you don't, then you blindly make decisions. I am pro-informed decision. And then, there's many times where you might have a bad experience with something or an unfavorable experience. I shouldn't say bad, an unfavorable experience with something. You don't like Brussels sprouts. Well, let me try cooking them a different way and then you might like them. Being steamed on top of the stove, that's a different experience than marinating them in balsamic vinegar and putting them on the grill. It's like eating a different food. I said that to say this. Here's kind of like the evolution, the upward progression of experiences. I don't like it to making an informed decision to the highest and best decision-making method of all time is this. Make a new decision based upon new information. You don't like Brussels sprouts? Well, let me make them different. That way you can make a new decision rather than a blanket decision. Make a new decision based upon new information. Let's get started. What tiny effort, movement, action, or attitude can you practice this week that will help you make more money? What can you do this week? I work in a very humble trade. 
Now, I'm a therapist, a trained professional therapist with decades of experience. I know human behavior. I've worked with mildly neurotic people and I've worked with serial killers. The worst of the worst. Great spectrum of human behavior. And I cut hair. It's a trade. I have a profession in a trade. In my trade, can you, I mean, think about, think about the trades and the humility of the trades. Some of the trades are with a circular saw and a hammer and a level and a tape measure or a pipe wrench or various tools of the trade. And you don't have to deal with people for the most part. And then there's the trades where you have to deal with people. They are humbling. Like, ooh, touching people. Someone said to me, I could never ever do hair because I'd have to touch people. And you, ha you definitely, if, if you have that ooh, touching people thing, then the beauty and handsome industry is not for you. But I touch people with my hands, touch their scalps, their necks, their faces. It's something I do. It's part of my trade. It's humbling. When you work with people, it's humbling. Because you take the role of a servant, even though I like to say that I turned a humble trade into a profession, but the reality is it's still a very humble trade. One of the things that I did was I keep a microfiber mitt in the bottom drawer at my, where I cut hair. I have a, a tool, like a rolling toolbox, you know, with the skinny drawers and then a big bottom drawer like you would see in a mechanic's garage. And I have my hair tools in there, combs and scissors and clippers and various lotions and potions. And one of the things I have is a big microfiber mitt and that if a person's shoes are dirty, they don't get to leave my chair until I take that microfiber mitt and clean their shoes. I will spray a little shine spray on the mitt and clean their shoes. I mean, apart from washing feet, is, and let's just say apart from washing feet and wiping asses, is there anything more humbling than cleaning shoes? Here I am a magnificent career, a magnificent humble trade, approaching my seventh decade on this earth, and I squat down to clean shoes. When I started doing that, people were blown away, blown away. I would have a man in the chair, give him a haircut, clean him up, clean the shoes off. I cut someone's hair, I have them stand in front of me, if it happens to be a work day, I straighten out their tie, even out their lapels, clean everything off their shoulders. Stand, this is what I do, stand right here in front of me, and they stand there. I straighten out the tie, lapels, fix the hair, turn around, and I spin them around, get all the hair off, servant kind of stuff. Pat them on the shoulder, pop, you're done, you look great servant kind of stuff. What little servanty kind of thing can you do in your business that is leveraged properly can make you more money? What little thing can you do in your business that can be leveraged, that, that is perceived as high value that can be leveraged into a higher gratuity or someone gifting you? What can you do? Making money is your priority. Making money, you can do more with money than you can without money. You want to feed the hungry? It takes money. You want to give people Bibles? It takes money. You want to educate people and create a education center, a university? It takes money. You want to create a daybreak ranch where people can be mentored, counseled, and get their life going in the right direction and recover from bad decisions, bad marriages, bad relationships, it takes money. What can you do to create more revenue as a result of tweaking one little service that you do? Can you hear that rain? I got a skylight right up here and that's what you're hearing is, is the rain hitting the skylight.
you will report them. Headline in a local publication says, Montgomery County party goers are not cooperating with contact tracers. Some people who have tested positive for the virus have declined to give names of other party goers, Montgomery County officials said. You will report your friends and family and be rewarded by the government. You will report them. You will wear a mask. You will take the vaccine. Well, I love a rainy night. I love a rainy night. I love to hear the thunder. Watch the lightning when it lights up the sky. You know, it makes me feel good. Eddie Rabbit, 1980. Did you like Eddie Rabbit? He died at 56 years old of lung cancer. I really liked his music. What's the other one? Uh, I got goosebumps just now thinking about it. That's, it's like the, the truck driving song. Driving My Life Away, is that the name of the song? The windshield wipers slapping out of tempo. What a great song. And I guess that was what, 19, that was in the 70s. What a great song. Go listen to that after this video. Driving My Life Away. It's a great song. Eddie Rabbit. Did I ever tell you that if she dresses nicer for girls' night out than she does for you? If she dresses sexier for girls' night out than she does for you, the relationship is over? Did I ever tell you that? I'm not sure if I did. But I'm just reminding you, if she dresses sexier for a girls' night out than she does for you when you go out with her, the relationship is over. How do I know? Because I was that guy that would spot women going out. I was that lone wolf that would separate from my pack of guy friends. And I knew the girls that were out for girls' night out. I'm not like that now. I'm a reformed gentleman. A reformed... I don't even like using the word pickup artist. I don't like that. I don't like the connotations there. But I was the guy that would spot the group of women coming in and knew exactly what I was going to do. The five girls coming in for, they were celebrating one of them, one of the girls' birthday. I knew exactly who I was going to approach and when I was going to do it. And it worked 100% of the time. Beware of the lone wolf. People travel in groups because they feel they have more strength. For men who want to meet women in that way, out in public, traveling with another man, a wingman, is false. That is a myth that you need a wingman. Nothing more attractive to a woman than a confident man who stands on his own and doesn't need his friends for support. Do I regret those days? No. Would I repeat them? No. I like my life now. Sanity, clarity, and reason. It's never too late to have sanity, clarity, and reason. What she says, I don't want to spend the rest of my life alone. What she means, I don't want to have to pay this mortgage by myself. Men, are you half of the bills? Think about it. She can swing the bills on her own for a while after she's separated or divorced, but she doesn't want to. You are half her bills, half her rent, half her mortgage. Never move in with a woman. Never move in with a woman. If you have a woman move in with you, make sure that your name is on the title, on the paperwork, on the lease, or both. Never move in somewhere where you are not on the title or the lease. Never, ever, ever do it. You've been warned. Regarding relationships, come from a place of joy and trust in yourself. And you will do great. You won't get hurt. You won't get confused. You won't end up hating people. You won't have to join a weird group of men who are all gathering together saying women suck. 
You don't have to be one of those guys. The welcome mat is out for sanity, clarity, and reason. Come home to sanity. And on a lighter note, let's read some quotes from Christopher Morley, one of my top authors, the guy that I just love his, I love his work, love it. I'll read you a few things from him. There's no mistaking a real book when one meets it. It's like falling in love. I showed you the books that I'm reading. Some I'm enjoying, some I'm loving. Some give you information, some give you inspiration. You need a balance of both. If you're too inspired, and this is, these are my thoughts, if you're too inspired, you get nothing done. If you're too educated and too informed, you become an arrogant prick and nobody wants to be around you. If you are alone, let it be your idea, not other people's ideas. It's better to choose to be alone than be left alone by people. Christopher Morley says, read every day something no one else is reading. Think every day something no one else is thinking. Do every day something no one else would be silly enough to do. It's bad for the mind to always be part of unanimity. Going along with the crowd. Be different. March to the beat of a different drummer. When you sell a man a book, you don't just sell 12 ounces of paper and ink and glue. You sell him a new life love and friendship and humor, and ships at sea by night, there's all heaven and earth in a book, a real book. Can you see why I really like Christopher Morley? If we discovered that we only had five minutes left to say all that we wanted to say, every telephone booth, you could tell this is a hundred years old, every telephone booth would be occupied by people calling other people to stammer and say the words, I love you. Am I right? If you had five minutes to live, who would you call? Put your answer down below. This is my way of encourage, encouraging you to interact with me. If you had five minutes to live, who would you call? Great question, isn't it? No man, <laughs> this is great, no man is lonely while eating spaghetti because it requires so much attention. That's because he's not using a spoon. You got your fork, your spoon, then you twirl the spaghetti on the fork so you're not like slurping up that spaghetti. You gotta learn to use the spoon with the fork. And no, you can't eat spaghetti with chopsticks. Here's a great one. Printer's ink has been running a race against gunpowder these many, many years. Ink is handicapped in a way because you can blow up a man with gunpowder in half a second while it may take 20 years to blow him up with a book. But the gunpowder destroys itself along with its victim while a book can keep on exploding for centuries. The real purpose of books is to trap the mind into doing its own thinking. Is that just amazing? I love this. You know when you lend a book to a friend, some people say, just consider it gone. I've done that with CDs, record albums. I even have CDs and albums and books and cassette tapes that I've had for 40 years, over 45 years, that I forget who I borrowed them from. And I, I know I've lost albums and cassettes and books and CDs. On the return of a book lent to a friend, I give humble and hearty thanks for the safe return of this book, which having endured the perils of my friend's bookcase and the bookcases of my friend's friends, now returns to me in reasonably good condition. I give humble and hearty thanks that my friend did not see fit to give this book to his infant as a plaything, nor use it as an ashtray for his burning cigar, nor as a teething ring for his dog. When I lent this book, I deemed it as lost. I was resigned to the bitterness of the long parting. I never thought to look upon its pages again, but now that the book has come back to me, I rejoice and am exceedingly glad. Bring hither the fatted Morocco. Let us rebind the volume and set it on the shelf of honor. For this, my book was lent and is now returned again. Presently, therefore, I may return some of the books that I myself have borrowed. Christopher Morley, now you know why I love this man's writing. And with that, finish your coffee. 
and I'll see you tomorrow on the Daybreak Show, your home of sanity, clarity, and reason. Start with a statement and then just elaborate. Start with a statement, okay. Yeah, what I'm going to do, I'll say something and then that'll kind of spark something and then we'll just kind of just let it flow. Okay. You are a collector, not necessarily a hoarder. Yeah, I guess. I guess I'll go along with that. Okay. I don't know. There might be a difference of opinion on that. I do have a lot of fountain pens. How many fountain pens do you have? I, pr I am sure I have thousands. But I buy and sell them too, so that's my excuse. They're inventory. Just like I have 100 suits and 50 hats. Because, you know, I discovered the charms of vintage items that were made to a higher standard than modern things are. And somebody has already made their nut on these products. And somebody's already put them, manufactured them and put them under the marketplace. And they, they have these superior, this, this superior workmanship and these superior materials. And now we can buy them for whatever they cost at a, at a flea market. So it's true of all these various things that were made in the past. So I have a lot of things like that. And that's my excuse. I like that. They're inventory. <laughs> They're inventory. See, when I was when I had a regular job, and I wasn't buying and selling vintage fountain pens and other things for a living, if, if I had a fountain pen, it was because I was either using it or because I was a collector. But now I have an even better excuse. It's just inventory. So I could buy a collection of 100 fountain pens, and I could enjoy owning them. It's a business them. expense. It's a business. It, not, I got a tax deduction as well. You know, not just an excuse. Yes. So you have some pens here. Okay, okay. So this is just a random selection of some pens that I happen to have with me. And um, they kind of illustrate some of the issues that we collectors have. Like, do you want to own every one of a certain kind of pen? Do you want an example of every single pen that was ever made? Or do you want to, or, or do, you, do you just have them to use? Or do you use some of them and not use some of them? And with me, I got started because of how they write. So that's what got me interested. I discovered these old fountain pens, and they did these wonderful things. You could you could take this pen from the 20s, and it would have this nib that was slightly flexible, so that when you push down, the line gets a little bit fatter. Something from 1920. Yeah, from the... It wasn't... As in 100 years old. Exactly, yeah. Like uh, this... Well, that's, that's not a flexible nib, but it's a charming pen. This is a swan pen from the 1920s. It's made of hard rubber or ebonite. It's what they had in those days before plastics. And you find them today, and they're faded to a brown, which to me makes it more charming. But some people try to get the brownness out and make them jet black again. But in the, in the old days, these were jet black. And this is a lever-filling pen that has a lever here, rubber sack inside. You pull the lever, it squeezes the rubber sack. You release the lever, and it sucks up the ink. Mm -hmm. So you dip it into a, a bottle of ink and fill it that way. And... When these things are adjusted and tuned so that they're right properly, they, you know, these have been beat up and abused for, in many cases, 100 years. But if you get one that's writing properly, you have this quality of pressureless touch where it makes contact with the paper, it writes right away, and it requires no actual pressure. So you don't... So the weight of the pen... No, it's not the weight of the pen. Not even that. Uh, well, yeah, it's... Th that's all that's necessary. It's just the contact just between the, the contact nib itself. and the paper creates enough capillary attraction that the ink just flows. So you don't have to push like you have to do with a ballpoint. But what I discovered, what really got me um, hooked on the old pens is that I discovered that there were these pens that had these nibs that were somewhat flexible so that when you press down, the line got wider. So you can do stuff like that. And I have the pen that did that, but I don't have any ink. So I can't exactly do it for you. 